morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let me welcome you to this morning's uh, discussion on the legislature and governance uh, discussion documents towards the National Policy Conference of the African National Congress, which will take place on the 30th of June to the 5th of July at the Nesrek Expo uh, Center. Um, we are discussing this document today led by the chairperson of the ANC-NEC Subcommittee on Legislation and Governance, Comrade Ayanda Lodro. Uh, with her today, uh, sitting on her left-hand side is uh, Comrade Tabom Gwena, who is a member of the subcommittee. Next to him, Comrade Obed Babela, ANC-NEC member and member of the subcommittee. Right at the end is Comrade uh, Colette Clark. On my right, Comrade Bingi Muloi, a member of the ANC, NEC, sub, uh, ANC, NEC and the Subcommittee on Legislature and Governance. Comrade Andris Nell, who is a member of the subcommittee. Comrade Lichisa Tsenoli, a member of the subcommittee. And right at the end, Comrade Pakstow, who is also a member of the subcommittee. Behind me, sorry, do apologize for that. Behind me is Comrade uh, uh, Chippy Oliver, who is also a member of the Subcommittee on Legislature and Governance. Um, without wasting any time, we'll ask Comrade Ayanda to come and speak to the statement on the document. Thank you so much, Comrade Kosela. Good morning. Uh, some of the members of the LNG subcommittee are sitting with the journalists over there, and I will not mention them all, but uh, there's Comrade Mike Sutcliffe, uh, Comrade... Uh, Gidlana, Matibula, Bushielo, Dipofa. Yeah, I, I won't mention all of them. Um, preparations for the ANC National Policy Conference entails consultations with key sectors of our society so as to ensure that the ANC is not blinded to the voices of our people. This media conference is an important step towards reaching more members of our society in frank and open discourse about the key state matters that affect their lives as South Africans. South Africa has advanced since 1994. The ANC-led restructuring and transformation in various sectors of society, albeit to varying degrees and impact. The main challenges of poverty, inequality, and land dispossession persist to date. The capacity and capability of the state is the most critical factor <coughs> to the solution of this challenge. Over the past 20 years, the ANC government in all three spheres has delivered basic services <coughs> at an unprecedented scale. We still have many backlogs to address to recover from the effects of the apartheid spatial development and racist delivery processes. New challenges have, however, emerged, including the need to improve the quality of basic services as opposed to a focus only on quantity, addressing rapid urbanization through the extension of services and infrastructure in urban areas, and expansion of the basket of social welfare support. All these require much smarter approaches, including greater use of new technologies. Whilst continuing to deliver services to those who don't have, the ANC government must also address the new demands of the empowered. And all of this is done in an economy which is not growing sufficiently to cater for the few, sort of to cater for the new demands. This illuminates the paradox of the success of our democratic state. Importantly, 83% of South Africans live on 2% of the land surface of South Africa. The continuous increase in urbanization and densities of these areas create further governance and developmental challenges. The center theme and primary task of this paper is to build the capacity of the state, the ability to plan, implement, enforce, monitor, and achieve the desired objectives. The policy paper focuses largely on the capacity and capability of the state in respect to political institutions and state machinery. It addresses issues of governance, configuration of the state, the public service, institutions supporting democracy, and the framework for state-owned entities. To, this, to do this, we must ensure the capacity of the state and the capabilities of the people working for the state and that they are continuously improved. We must ensure we better integrate what we do across many spheres and sectors of government, and we enable all the elements of civil society to become more active in working with the state to achieve its aims. At the heart of the legislature and governance policy paper is an assertion that power belongs to the people. The ANC has been entrusted with this political power to advance and pursue the needs of our people. 
This is irrespective of whether you voted for the ANC or not. The ANC government cares and caters for all citizens, and it remains the premier organization capable of driving the transformation program. The policy paper clearly articulates that despite significant achievements since 1994, the broader task of social and economic transformation is far from over. The paper also acknowledges that state institutions still require transformation to adequately meet the needs of all South Africans. Economic discontent are dealt with extensively in the economic transformation sector. However, the state has a key role to play in enabling the policy and legislative environment conducive for economic transformation and economic growth. The tools for economic transformation under the state include licensing, transformation charters, land reform, state procurement, and interventions by DFIs and SOEs, amongst others. To address some of the structural deficiencies and coordination in building a capable state, the policy paper posits that the presidency is the strategic center of governance. Therefore, the presidency must be reconfigured and capacitated to drive strategic coordination, resource planning, prioritization in line with the objectives of the developmental state and the National Development Plan. This must include alignment of public service administration, provinces, municipalities, and state-owned entities. The ANC has noted with serious concern the escalating levels of corruption in society. This includes both the public and private sector. We know that this is fast becoming a threat to good governance. We're consulting extensively with civil society and key role players on effective mechanisms to combat corruption. The policy conference will pronounce on precise and targeted mechanisms and policy instruments to decisively deal with corruption in our society. The policy paper also notes the leading role played by SOEs in creating economic and social infrastructure, such as electricity, rail, roads, water, and the provision of housing and schools. We have unfortunately also noted that some of the SOEs are plagued by issues of poor governance and allegations of corruption. The process of consultation and finalizing of the governance and oversight protocols for, F for SOEs is underway. This will focus on how to empower the public to hold SOEs accountable, how legislatures play their role in tightening oversight, and the executive taking full control in managing their portfolios of the SOEs. <coughs> the policy paper also repositions the fifth parliament to lead society as a true parliament of the people. This includes strengthening the, SO the NCOP as the center of provinces and municipalities. The institutional structure of parliament will also be strengthened with new political offices necessary to fully execute on the mandate. The ANC is reviewing the system of traditional leadership, intense engagements and consultations with key role players in the traditional governance system are underway. There's a planned consultative conference on traditional leadership which will advance the cause of the sector. In respect of provincial and local government, previous ANC conferences have adopted transformative resolutions in respect to fiscal configuration, governance, and service delivery institutionalization. Those re resolutions will require significant resources, time, and legislative amendments to be implemented. Excuse me. In summary, this policy paper makes policy recommendations on the following areas. The need to consolidate political power in all spheres of government to drive transformation in order to improve its effectiveness and efficiency in selecting the right election candidates and running its election campaigns. A dedicated political and technical election machinery is to be developed. An ANC electoral commission will focus on ensuring the credibility, integrity, and capacity of ANC elected public representatives that given the scale and complexity of government's delivery across three spheres of government and the SOEs, the strategic center of power in the, in the presidency must be strengthened to drive the implementation of the National Development Plan and also to align planning and policy, resource allocation and enforcement. The aim here is to improve the alignment and integration of policies and development across the spheres and sectors of government. In addition, a presidential commission on, pro on provinces will be established to review the alignment powers of functions of all three spheres of government 
with a specific focus on the provincial roles and responsibilities. That the public service must be modernized, made smarter, more capable, and must operate efficiently, effectively, and economically. That the national special development framework being developed by the NPC and DPME and the integrated urban development framework coordinated by COCTA must guide, align, and structure developmental outcomes to redress the spatial injustices of, the, of apartheid whilst improving efficiency and effectiveness of development across our country. That we must establish political centers in our legislatures consistent with other arms of state, the Speaker of Parliament, the establishment of a Chief Whip of Parliament. We need to review the roles and responsibilities of legislatures. We need to review the NCOP and strengthen its role as a political center for provinces and local government. We must also ensure the urgent implementation of the review of the SOE report and the oversight and governance of SOEs. That the roles and responsibilities of traditional leadership needs to be resolved and in, in this regard that a consultative conference be held. The ANC is not oblivious to the magnitude of challenges facing our people and also facing the state. We share in the people's impatience to overcome the crises of unemployment, crime, poverty, and growing inequality and corruption. The ANC remains loyal to the Freedom Charter and the principle of the people shall govern. Therefore, the attainment of power by the ANC is a means to fulfill the will of the people by ensuring a better life for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Comrade Ayanda. Succinct, concise, comprehensive summary on the discussion paper. I have no doubt that our <laughs> colleagues in the media would have read the documents and therefore are going to engage on the documents based on what is contained in the documents as we move towards policy conference. Um, I will open for questions. Um, I'll take uh, two rounds. Uh, first one of three and we'll come back again for more questions. I see any hands? Uh, SABC number one. Everybody else is still marinating on the issues that have been raised. Eldrin, you can go. I'm sure we'll get more questions as we proceed. <coughs>
Colin, can you just repeat that question specifically? The last one. Uh, yeah, the last around one. from the local government elections, has it been? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so what was the Thank you. Um, as the chairperson comes up to direct the answering of the questions, can I just make a point that when the policy documents were released, there was no brand returning to ESCOM situation. <laughs> so um, the, the, the documents speak to principles uh, around the issues of governance. Um, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Kosel. You've answered my <laughs> question <laughs> because I was also going to say I'm here just to deal with the policy conference issues. And you must remember that this is a discussion document. Nothing is cast in stone. What you see presented before you today is what will guide discussion in conference, at the policy conference. And this is what we will take depending on the outcome at the policy conference, that is what we will take for further discussion at uh, the national conference in December. So as we respond to the questions that have been raised, just bear that in mind, that this is, this is not cast in stones. As correctly written there, it is just discussion documents. We're still going to conference, and in some other areas, we still are actually consulting with other stakeholders within, within our sector. So as we progress, by the time we get to December, this, some of the things here might have changed, some of them would be uh, enhanced, and some of them might just remain the same. So I think we just all need to move from that premise. I'll just ask uh, the various people who are sitting on the podium here with me just to assist in answering to some of the questions. Colette will deal with the questions that relate to the reconfiguration of the state and all other questions related to that, including on state, state capacity and state capability. Um, Comrade Tabo will respond on the SOEs and best, best practice and also on the naturalized person. Um, Comrade Andres and Comrade um, will respond on, no, not Lichesa, so Comrade Andres and Comrade um, Parks will respond on the local government issues. But Comrade Parks, specifically on the question that you just raised, on the role of the party, its councillors, and also whether or not we've reflected on the balance of forces as, as the ANC. And Comrade Lechisa will respond to questions that relate to, oh, Comrade uh, Chippy will, will respond to the question on the strategic partnership arrangements, which uh, some call coalitions. Thank you. Colette. Yeah, just in terms of the question that has been uh, asked around the macro configuration uh, of the state, it's important to note that the challenges that had been raised in the NDP which provides the social vision had raised concern about the aspects of the macro configuration of the state. Also, the 1998 Presidential Review Commission raised the aspects of um, recommendations that need to bring about the strategic center. Now, it's, it's very interesting that the Constitution already provides for the powers of the president in relation to the national administration. And the national administration exactly the same as the provincial administration. Um, let's just speak to the provincial administration. You have a premier at that level of polity with a provincial administration horizontally dealing with that particular tier of governance. At a local government level, exactly the same. But at a national level, there is an element of disparate arrangements with regards to the governance arrangements in how it's configured. And hence, a mirror in relation to 
the national administration needs to be extremely cogent and is extremely understood with two distinct legs, one dealing with the support to the executive, which is the cabinet secretariat as well as the policy oversight in terms of policy capability support, as well as then dealing with what would one call the administration and planning functions which worldwide constitute what you would have in the national administration. So what it would mean is that for the departments that have got functions that are determined around uh, public administration, which is the National Treasury Ministry, those ministries are defined in the Constitution. Cooperative governance is defined in the Constitution. Public administration is defined in the Constitution. Public services is defined in the Constitution. The functions that are defined in the Constitution are clearly the ones that drive the state machinery, the technical capacity of the state machinery. What we also have to understand is throughout the world, the role of the presidency is about governance oversight, and the governance oversight needs a strong administrative oversight. And the administrative oversight then has a management oversight. Those are different functions at different levels of governance, all composed at a national level for that particular tier of government. When you move into the other tiers of government, you have a horizontal arrangement with regards to the governance uh, uh, responsibilities and accountabilities which are clearly defined in the Constitution. So there, are no need, there is no need for any constitutional amendments because the Constitution is very clear in relation to those particular roles. It's a matter of structurally configuring what the Constitution has already made uh, arrangements uh, around for the accountability of the President in terms of two roles, President being the head of state <clears throat> and President being the head of government and government then dealing with the administration and also dealing with the executive. Thank you. Thanks, Colette. Tabo will then respond to the question on SOEs. Yeah, yeah in the first one, that was asked. Thank you, um, ladies and gentlemen, comrades. The, the question on and naturalized uh, persons. Oh, you said it randomly sprang into the document. And, uh, we've been having a discussion about uh, this matter for, for some time, and I think part of the reason why we have not elaborated extensively on it is because uh, we're busy doing consultations, including consulting with opposition parties um, <clears throat> in, in parliament and in various uh, legislatures. But the real issue here, it's not for naturalized person not to be elected as public office bearers. However, can they ascend the highest office in the land, the office of the presidency? Can they ascend the office of a premiership? Um, other people are saying, let's also include the, the discussions around, around the mayors. So we have not closed that. Um, we have been requested to look at this thing seriously and look at what are the implications of it. Uh, for us as a country to have, you know, naturalized persons. Uh, so we, we, we are embarking in this particular consultation. And I think, you know, the, <clears throat> the mood so far is that uh, it might not necessarily be an advisable uh, uh, issue to, um, to deal with. However, if we have to then change it, it will require a constitutional amendment. So definitely that is one of the issues that uh, we uh, will have to, to deal with. With respect uh, to the state-owned entities um, and the question that has been asked, I think from where the angle, the angle of uh, legislature and governance on this particular issue is that there are key engines of economic growth and development, um, but there are also strategic institutions of the state that must be used you know, to be able to to propel our agenda of, of, of development. Therefore, we are dealing with the type of governance arrangements and oversight on those particular um, SOEs. I think we are observing uh, possibly elements of uh, a decline in, in how we um, entities such as uh, possibly parliament and others are like uh, really performing that type of an oversight, but also how the executive has been asserting itself in, in the SOEs. Um, given your company laws, 
your um, establishment at of uh, some of those SOEs. So th there's issues around what is the role of the board of an SOE vis-a-vis -vis what is the role of a minister of, of an SOE and also what uh, becomes the role of a parliament a committee and, and that, including the presidents. So we want to clean up all those particular things and be able to come up with protocols that directly empowers, you know, the relevant people to be able to execute their functions. But more importantly, we also want to create a dispensation that will allow the public to be also be able to, you know, express their anxieties and then find a way of uh, those particular. So, uh, you asked a question, what will be the best practice mechanism? I think what we want, we want to have a governance structure that is adequately able to, to ensure that, you know, everybody else performs their role in accordance with, you know, their policy uh, uh, mandates. Thank you very much. I think, I think just, just to add to, to that one. SOEs, by their very nature, are expected to also perform a developmental function. And as it is now, it's, it, it's, it's a bit blurred. We don't quite see the benefits of, of that in tangible terms. They go about their business, but uh, not necessarily anchoring on the developmental agenda of, uh, of government <coughs> and also, and also adding, adding to it. And on best practice, I think your question was anchored around Brian Mulife and best practice, so she has, she has responded to that. If I may just ask Comrade Parks to come and respond to the question on um, the role of the ANC councillor and the balance of forces since August 3 last year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Comrade Tayan, and good morning. Let, let me start by saying that the ANC, since the democratic breakthrough, has had different experiences in South Africa. Uh, we've had a government of national unity, we've had coalition governments, we've participated in coalition governments ourselves as the ANC, and indeed we've sat in opposition benches, whether in KZN or in the Western Cape or in the city of Cape Town. So we've had different experiences as the ANC, and I know as people from Gauteng, we think it's a new experience, but actually we've had the different experiences as the ANC, and this is the experience that we're, that we're actually learning lessons from because we're actually now saying we need to co compile best practices and lessons learned from the different experiences of sitting in opposition benches and or participating in a coalition government and or um, engaging in an, in an environment where citizen or government is led by a coalition. Our view is that uh, as you engage in these processes, particularly as you sit in opposition benches, that you have different responsibilities. The first, of course, is to defend the gains of transformation. We think that it is important that we continue to defend the gains of transformation that we continue to articulate the agenda of transformation in whatever position that we're sitting in, whether in government or in opposition benches. So we think it's important that that narrative needs to reach across in councils and indeed to society that these are the things that need to be done to ensure that South Africa progresses and all the provinces and cities that, that we involved with progress. So we think that that's an important uh, part of the work that we need to do. Uh, we need to be effective in holding government to account. And I think it's important to make reference to the fact that it was actually an initiative by ANC-led councils that led to oversight mechanisms of councils. So the, the experience of being effective in exercising oversight is one that has already been learned. Um, what we're now doing is to say how do we become more effective in holding government to account and ensuring that uh, we engage the public in all the processes that we're involved with. Our view is that our role in sitting in opposition benches in any sphere that we're sitting in opposition benches is not just to sit and critique and issue press statements. It is also about constructive engagement 
uh, mobilizing society and communities and contributing towards the advancement of the agenda of the institutions that we're involved with and the agenda of transformation overall. Thank you very much. Comrade Parks, you've dealt with two, you've answered two questions and uh, thank you. No, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You did well. You did very well. Um, you've, you've just kicked Chippy out of uh, the podium. <laughs> thank you. On the, the provinces, I think uh, Comrade Andres uh, will, will come and respond to that one. Thank you very much, Chairperson, uh, comrades, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, the, the discussion document um, recognizes the fact that both our 52nd and 53rd conferences uh, passed resolutions calling for the establishment of a presidential commission to, to look at the question of provincial government. Um, to, and to look at provincial government in a quite a wide context that would cover both the number of provinces, uh, their powers, uh, their <coughs> capacity. I think regrettably that in the public discourse what has then emerged most strongly is the question of the number of provinces. And I think we, we really want to, to emphasize that we're dealing with a very, very complex issue that goes far beyond whether we should have nine or six or five or four or however many, many provinces. What is really at stake is, is how we configure um, our constitutional dispensation, giving recognition to three spheres of government, national, provincial, and local, which the Constitution describes as interdependent, interrelated, and needing to, to work in a cooperative governance fashion. How in that constitutional dispensation do you best allocate powers and functions across the three spheres of government? And I think we need to emphasize that, that on the whole, our constitution is serving us well. But the experience of almost 25 years in government, <coughs> of delivering services has also taught us that in certain respects, things might not be configured in the absolutely optimal way. That there are either areas of overlapping mandates, or in other cases, mandates that end up clashing, and overall, not giving the desired streamlined intergovernmental relations system that we feel we need to accelerate our service delivery and deal with some of the the pressing concerns uh, that face our, our society. So I think also just to add that whilst the, the document calls for the, the expeditious setting up of that commission, I think it would be important to recognize that a lot of work has been done since those conferences on other aspects of that work. So for example, um, the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs has, has embarked or has, is at a very advanced stage of looking at the two-tier system of, of municipalities, local municipalities and district municipalities and the allocation of powers and functions there. Cogta together with National Treasury, with SALGA, I mean have been looking at the intergovernmental fiscal arrangements. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So I think that there, there is a lot of good work that has been done uh, in in that regard, and I think essentially what what it what it then boils down to is that we we say in the document that we need a more predictable and coordinated system of how policy and priorities are set, and plans and budgets developed and implemented across those three spheres, and I think that question manifests itself especially strongly when one comes to, to, the, to other issues raised in the discussion document, like, for example, the management of urbanization and dealing with reversing apartheid spatial patterns. 
if you don't have that coherent system of intergovernmental relations where you, you, you plan properly across those, those three spheres and implement in a, a coordinated, collaborative fashion, your chances of dealing with those issues is, is so much, much less. So we, we would view that, that question within that uh, context. Thanks. Well, uh, morning, everyone. Uh, Comrade <coughs> Parks has largely covered me, so uh, I don't think I need to elaborate much more on the issue of coalitions. I wanted to just touch on one issue. I mean, uh, as he was saying, the, uh, the ANC doesn't enter into coalitions um, simply to get into power. It, it enters into coalitions in order to advance its policies and the principles of the National Democratic Revolution. Um, where it can find commonality, it does so. And in essence, that's a partnership. So our preferred way of talking about this is as, you know, governance partnerships, um, because they're aligned around a program and a set of principles. They're not simply a way of getting into power. Uh, thank you very much to the panel. I think there was, uh, you know, a mouthful, a lot of issues raised. I'm not sure if there would be any follow-ups, any new questions that members of the media would want to pose. Um, I will take a second round. Uh, I've got number one. Can I see by a show of hands? Uh, number two there. Going, going, going. Third question. Hmm? Speak now forever, hold your peace. <laughs> okay, Taylor. Thank you. Just on the last question, what we're dealing with is oversight, monitoring, evaluation, and planning. This is, this is really what this is all about. Even when we talk the modernization and the reconfiguration of the state, the most important catchphrases or catchwords there are accountability, monitoring, monitoring and evaluation, building capacity and state capability. We have not gone into discussion about immunity of, uh, of a sitting head of state. That discussion has not, uh, has not come up. On institutions supporting democracy, uh, Comrade Lechisa will, will respond to that one. And on the developmental agenda, it, it doesn't have to be an either or. It is an end or. Profitability, the bottom line, is very important for any institution. But for an institution of state, the developmental agenda is also key. So it's, it's a matter of finding a balance in the work that you do and ensuring that it supports what the National Development Plan calls on all state-owned entities, including government itself, 
in, way, in the way of ensuring that uh, we contribute towards the development of society. Uh, good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, comrades. The, the reference in the, in, the, in, the, in the document about uh, institutions that support democracy must be understood as part of the overall looking at the state and its broad machinery, uh, the three arms of the state, uh, to the extent that they do their work properly or not, the, the institutions that support democracy progress with the work they were intended to do and so on. You must remember that there was um, uh, decisions in the past that are in the process of implementation, and those are being discussed currently. But in the, in the policy conference, what we hope to reflect on is the role they have placed, their location, and how uh, they are serving their purposes and their mandates effectively. Even as we are doing work, uh, uh, the chairperson of this session uh, said to you that uh, there's discussion going on. You are probably aware uh, of discussions that are going on with those institutions themselves. Uh, but the most important part is that uh, going to conference, we, we hope to get some sense of where people think we are at with the work they have done, uh, but they have been an important cog in the system of governance in our country and very crucial. How they uh, can be improved is always the question that policy conference will be addressing. Thanks. Okay, if there's no further questions, then I would assume that we have come to the end of our press briefing. And you can see that I am drawing out the close to allow you to still raise one more question if you would wish. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, microphone to Eldrin, please. Where's the microphone? Yeah, speak up. Okay. Um, I was once here again from SABCB. Just a question about the way you guys know about the amount of tourism, which is what comes into my mind right now. In the debate that the country currently finds itself in um, after the president decided to, um, to reshuffle the cabinet. And the question has been, which was something that was raised by the former, the former Deputy Chief Justice, Dikhan Musenek, around the powers of the President in terms of hiring and firing members of the executive. And I wonder whether the country shouldn't start having that discussion around the powers of the President, where the President can hire and fire members of the Cabinet, and those members of the Cabinet don't go through a similar process like you find with the judges. The judges go through the JSC, um, uh, the, the, the leaders of Chapter 9 institutions, like the public protector as well, they go through par the parliamentary process where there are interviews, yet members of the cabinet don't go through that similar process, yet they have, um, they have um, very valuable and powerful power in terms of executive power. I'll ask uh, Comrade Orbit to respond, respond to, to that, that question. question, but let's also bear in mind what the Constitution says. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning. Yes, indeed, the Constitution has given the parameters of the powers that the President can exercise. And these powers is not only the President, the, the, the Premiers also have mm. their own powers, and also the Mayors could do so. Now, when you say president and confining it only to the president, you will then have to then say across the three spheres if we are to <coughs> open up a debate and an engagement on that particular issue. But the constitution is quite clear now, and I think all over the world, presidents have the prerogative to appoint ministers and disappoint ministers, and it has never been an issue uh, anywhere in the world. And therefore, I mean, this debate uh, currently in South Africa uh, I do not know what will be informing it. However, when you talk of the powers, we're also not talking about the sitting president. We, we, the policy discusses about the continuity of a government. And if at any point, obviously, South Africa feels that there are issues that ought to be amended in any way, we are doing so are a living democracy, and I think uh, we will continue engaging and assessing. But for now, I don't see any cause of a reason for us to be able to open up on that particular discussion. Thank you. 
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and let's thank you again for the role that you play in ensuring that these policy discussion documents are discussed in as broad a cross-section of society as possible. Uh, as you know, uh, we'll meet at the policy conference where we'll refine them and finally uh, put them up for adoption at the national conference in December of this year. Um, just a reminder to members of the media, the uh, media accreditation is open. Please do apply because we will be closing quite early this year to ensure that the necessary security protocols are in place. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you, Mama. My people, my people, thank you, my people. Who are watching? Are saying I must tell you that they love you. Let's listen to what table.